She has said that she is terrified, but that she believes she's there to tell the truth. She also says that it is not her responsibility to weigh in on whether uh, Judge Kavanaugh should be appointed to the Supreme Court. She says that is up for the Senate to decide. But if you look at her more than 2,000 word opening statement, it's chilling in the detail that she describes in this alleged assault by Brett Kavanaugh when they were in high school at two different schools, Brett Kavanaugh at Georgetown Prep and Dr. Ford, who was then at an all-girls school, Holton Arms. As you see this smaller uh, hearing room, this is in Dirksen 226. It was chosen because Dr. Ford and those who are working with her said they didn't want all the cameras in there. And so there are only three cameras inside this room, what we call pool cameras. Only seven photographers, still photographers, have been allowed inside and very few reporters. They are trying to make this not just a more intimate setting, but a more serious setting. We've also seen Rachel Mitchell. She is the Republican outside counsel who was brought in because she's the chief of special victims division at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office in Arizona. As you may know, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, on the Republican side, it's all males. And the concern was that questioning a woman who has described in graphic detail an assault, that it would not look right. And so they have deferred now to a prosecutor to do the questioning. She will do the questioning on the behalf of the Republicans. Each Democratic senator, and there are 10 of them, will get five minutes each. Let's go now to Ed O'Keefe, who is right outside that hearing room. Ed? Nora, good morning to you. This marble-lined hallway leads into Dirksen 226, and we've seen members of the committee make their way in. A few Democrats stopped here to tell us that they still think that five minutes is not nearly enough time for them to try to get to the bottom of this situation. They say they will be pressing Kavanaugh for details to try to establish his... Caf his, his uh... and, and we now see Dr. Ford for the first time. We've only seen two pictures of her up until now. One with a pair of sunglasses on, and then when she got a FBI polygraph test, not by the official FBI, but a former FBI agent. And that has, we've heard from, essentially where she recounted and was judged truthful in her remarks. Nancy Cordes is with me here. Nancy, what do we know about what we'll hear from Dr. Ford? Well, uh, she is going to go into very specific detail about what she says happened to her in the summer of 1982. This is, of course, a story that she told the Washington Post, but now she is going to be telling that story to a group of 21 senators and to the world. All right, Gail and John, I know you're watching this with me as well. Yes, it is very interesting, Nora, to see her for the first time because we've only had that one picture uh, when she was a teenager and then the picture of her with the sunglasses. We're told that her husband is not in the room with her today, that he stayed at home uh, with the children, so she's seated at the table with two of her attorneys. We Including saw Michael Weinstein. Bromwich. Yeah, Michael Bromwich, her attorney, is sitting next to her. That is yeah, one of her saw, lawyers. We saw her two attorneys. We've also seen Alyssa Milano in the room, which I think is interesting. I'm told that she was a guest of Senator Dianne Feinstein. But no matter how many people are in the room, when you talk to people who've had to testify, even on matters that are nowhere within the same country as the difficult ones that she's about to testify on, they talk about hearing their own voice in that huge room uh, as they start to speak. And that's just people you've, I've talked to who had to testify. This is someone who's obviously the whole world is watching. The hearing is about to associate justice on our Supreme Court. We will hear from two witnesses Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. Thanks, of course, to Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh for accepting our committee's invitation to testify and also thank them for their volunteering to testify before we even invite it. Both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh have been through a terrible couple weeks. They and their families have received vile threats. What they have endured ought to be considered by all of us as unacceptable and a f poor reflection on the state of civility in our democracy. So I want to apologize to you both for the way you've been treated. And I intend, hopefully, for today's hearing to be safe 
comfortable and dignified for both of our witnesses. I hope my colleagues will join me in this effort of a show of civility. With that said, I lament that this hearing, how this hearing has come about. On July the 9th, 2018, the President announced Judge Kavanaugh's nomination to serve on the Supreme Court. Judge Kavanaugh has served on the most important federal appellate court for 12 years. Before that, he held some of the most sensitive positions in the federal government. The President added Judge Kavanaugh to his short list of Supreme Court more than nine months ago in November 2017. As part of Judge Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court, the FBI conducted its sixth full field background investigation of Judge Kavanaugh <coughs> since 1993, 25 years ago. Nowhere in any of these six FBI <coughs> reports, which committee investigators have reviewed on a bipartisan basis, was there a whiff of any issue, any issue at all related in any way to inappropriate sexual behavior. Dr. Ford first raised her allegations in a secret letter uh, to the uh, ranking member nearly two months ago in July. This letter was secret from July 30th, September 13th, to, uh, no, July 30th until September 13th when I first heard about it. The ranking member took no action. The letter wasn't shared with me, our colleagues, or my staff. These allegations could have been investigated in a way that maintained the confidentiality that Dr. Ford uh, requested. Before his hearing, Judge Kavanaugh met privately with 65 senators, including the ranking member. But the ranking member didn't ask Judge Kavanaugh about the allegations when she met with him privately in August. The Senate Judiciary Committee held its four-day public hearing from September 4th to September 7th. Judge Kavanaugh testified for more than 32 hours uh, in public. We held a closed session for members to ask sensitive questions on, that on the last evening, which the ranking member did not attend. Judge Kavanaugh answered nearly 1,300 written questions submitted by senators after the hearing, more than all prior Supreme Court nominees. Throughout this period, we did not know about the ranking member's secret evidence. Then, only at an 11th hour, on the eve of Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation void, did the ranking member refer the allegations to the FBI. And then, sadly, the allegations were leaked to the press. And that's where Dr. Uh, Ford was mistreated. This is a shameful way to treat our witness, who insisted on confidentiality. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, who has had to address these allegations in the midst of a media circus. When I received Dr. Ford's letter on September the 13th, my staff and I recognized the seriousness of these allegations and immediately began our committee's investigation consistent with the way the committee has handled such allegations in the past. Every step of the way, the Democratic side refused to participate in what should have been a bipartisan investigation. And as far as I know, on all of our judgeships throughout at least the last four years, or three years, that's been the way it's been handled. After Dr. Ford's identity became public, my staff contacted all the individuals she uh, uh, said attended the 1982 party described in the Washington Post article. Judge Kavanaugh immediately submitted to an interview under penalty of felony for any knowingly false statements. He denied the allegations categorically. Democratic staff was invited to participate and could have asked any questions they wanted to, but they declined. Which leads me then to wonder, if 
they're really concerned with going to the truth, why wouldn't you want to talk to the accused? The process and procedure is what the committee always does when we receive allegations of wrongdoing. My staff reached out to other individuals allegedly at the party, Mark Judge, Patrick Smith, Leland uh, Kaiser. All three submitted statements to the Senate under, under penalty of felony, denying any knowledge of the events described by Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford's lifelong friend, Dr. Ms. Kaiser, um, stated she doesn't know Judge Kavanaugh and doesn't recall ever attending a party with him. My staff made repeated requests to interview Dr. Ford during the past 11 days, even volunteering to fly to California to take her testimony. But her attorneys refused to prevent, present her allegations to Congress. I, never, I nevertheless honored her request for a public hearing, so Dr. Ford today has the opportunity to prevent her allegations under oath. As you can see, the Judiciary Committee was able to conduct thorough investigations into allegations, or thorough investigations into allegations. Some of my colleagues, consistent with their stated desires to obstruct Kavanaugh's nomination by any means precise, uh, by any means necessary, pushed for FBI investigations into the allegations. But I have no authority to force the executive branch agency to conduct an investigation into a matter it considers to be closed. Moreover, once the allegations become, became public, it was easy to identify all the alleged witnesses and conduct our own investigations. Contrary to what the public has been led to believe, the FBI doesn't perform any credibility assessments or verify the truth of any events in these background investigations. I'll quote then Chairman Joe Biden during Justice Thomas's confirmation hearing. This is what Senator Biden said, quote, the next person who refers to an FBI report as being worth anything obviously doesn't understand anything. The FBI explicitly does not in this or any other case reach a conclusion, period. They say he, he said, she said, they said, period. So when people wave an FBI report before you, understand they do not. They do not. They do not reach conclusions. They do not make recommendations. End of Senator Biden's quote. The FBI provided us with the allegations. Now it's up to the Senate to assess their credibility, which brings us to this very time. I look forward to a fair and respectful hearing. That's what we promised Dr. Ford. Some of my colleagues have complained about the fact that an expert on this side is investigating sex crimes will be questioning the witness. I see no basis for complaint other than just plain politics. The testimony we will hear today concerns allegations of sexual assault, very serious allegations. This is an incredibly complex and sensitive subject to discuss, and it's not an easy one to discuss. That is why the senators on this side of the dais believe an expert who has deep experience and training in interviewing victims of sexual assault and investigating sexual assault allegations should be asking questions. This will be a stark contrast to the grandstanding and chaos that we saw from the other side during the previous four days in this hearing process. I can think of no one better equipped to question the witnesses than Rachel Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell is a career prosecutor civil servant with decades of experience investigating and prosecuting sex crimes. She has dedicated her career to seeking justice for survivors of sex-related felonies. Most recently, Rachel was a division chief of the Special Victims Division, Maricopa County Attorney's Office, which prosecutes sex crimes and family violence. Then Democratic Senator Governor Janet Napolitano Previously recognized her 
as the Outstanding Arizona Sexual Assault Prosecutor of the Year. And she has spent years instructing prosecutors, detectives, and child protection workers on how to properly interview victims of sexual assault and abuse. With her aid, I look forward to a fair and productive hearing. I understand that there are two other public allegations. Today's hearing was scheduled to, uh, f in close consultation with Dr. Ford's attorneys, and her testimony will be the subject of this hearing. We have been trying to investigate other allegations. At this time, we have not had cooperation from attorneys representing other clients, and they have made no attempt to substantiate their claims. My staff has tried to secure testimony and evidence from attorneys for both Deborah Ramirez and Julie Swetnick. My staff made eight requests, yes, eight requests, for evidence from attorneys for Ms. Ms. Ramirez, and six requests for, for evidence for attorneys for Ms. Swetnick. Neither attorney has made their clients available for interview. The committee can't do an investigation if attorneys are stonewalling. I hope you all understand that we have attempted to seek additional information, as we do a lot of times when there are holes in what we call the BI reports. Additionally, all the witnesses should know uh, by when I say all the witnesses, I mean Dr. Ford and I mean uh, Judge Kavanaugh. All the witnesses should know that they have the right under Senate Rule 26.5 to ask that the committee go into closed session if a question requires an answer that is a clear invasion of their right to privacy. If either Dr. Ford or Judge Kavanaugh feel that S Senate Rule 26.5 ought to be involved, they should simply say so. Uh, Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll make just a brief comment on your references to me. Uh, yes, I did receive a letter uh, from Dr. Ford. Uh, it was conveyed to me by a member of Congress, uh, Anna Eshoo. Um, the next day, I called Dr. Ford. We spoke on the phone. She reiterated that she wanted this held confidential, and I held it confidential up to a point where the witness was willing to come forward. And I think as I make my remarks, perhaps you'll see why. Because how women are treated in the United States with this kind of concern is really wanting a lot of reform. And I'll get to that for a minute, but in the meantime, Good morning, Dr. Ford. Thank you for coming forward and being willing to share your story with us. I know this wasn't easy for you. But before you get to your testimony, and the chairman chose not to do this, I think it's important to make sure you're properly introduced. Uh, by and the way, I have to. I was going to introduce her, but if you want to introduce her, I'll be glad to have you do that. But I want you to know I didn't forget to do it because I would do that just as she was about to speak. Thank you. I have to say, when I saw your CV, I was extremely impressed. You have a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, two master's degrees, one from Stanford and one from Pepperdine, and a PhD from the University of Southern California, better known to Senator Harris and I as USC. You are a professor affiliated with both Stanford University and Palo Alto University. You have published over 65 peer-reviewed articles and have received numerous awards for your work and research. And as if that were not enough, you are a wife, a mother of two sons, and a constituent from California. So I am very grateful to you for your strength and your bravery in coming forward. I know it's hard. But before I turn it over, I want to say something about what is to be discussed today and where we are as a country. <clears throat> Sexual violence is a serious problem and one that largely goes unseen. In the United States, it's estimated by the Centers for Disease Control, 
one in three women and one in six men will experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. According to the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, 60% of sexual assaults go unreported. In addition, when survivors do report their assaults, it's often years later due to the trauma they suffered and fearing their stories will not be believed. Last week, I received a letter from a 60-year-old California constituent who told me that she survived an attempted rape at age 17. She described as being terrified and embarrassed. She never told a soul until much later in life. The assault stayed with her for 43 years. I think it's important to remember these realities as we hear from Dr. Ford about her experience. There's been a great deal of public discussion about the Me Too movement today versus the year of the woman almost 27 years ago. But while young women are standing up and saying no more, our institutions have not progressed in how they treat women who come forward. Too often, women's memories and credibility come under assault. In essence, they are put on trial and forced to defend themselves and often re-victimized in the process. 27 years ago, I was walking through an airport when I saw a large group of people gathered around the TV to listen to Anita Hill tell her story. What I saw was an attractive woman in a blue suit before an all-male Judiciary Committee speaking of her experience of sexual harassment. She was treated badly, accused of lying, attacked, and her credibility put to the test throughout the process. Today, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford has come forward to tell her story of being assaulted and fearing for her life when she was a teenager. Initially, as I said, Dr. Ford did not want to make her story public. Then, within 36 hours of coming forward, Republicans scheduled a hearing without talking to her or even inviting her to testify. She was told she had to show up for the, or the committee would move forward with a vote. It took a public outcry for the, from the majority, excuse me, for the majority to back down and give her even a few days to come before the committee. Republicans also scheduled this hearing with Dr. Ford without having her allegations investigated by the FBI. In 1991, Anita Hill's allegations were reviewed by the FBI, as is the normal process and squarely within its jurisdiction. However, despite repeated requests, President Trump and the Republicans have refused to take this routine step and direct the FBI to conduct an impartial investigation. This would clearly be the best way to ensure a fair process to both Judge Kavanaugh and to Dr. Ford. In 1991, the Senate heard from 22 witnesses over three days. Today, while rejecting an FBI investigation, Republicans are refusing to hear testimony from any other witness, including Mark Judge, who Dr. Ford identified as being in the room when the attack took place. And we believe Judge should be subpoenaed so the committee can hear from him directly. Republicans have also refused to call anyone who could speak to the evidence that would support or refute Dr. Ford's claim, and not one witness um, who could address credibility and character of either Ford or Kavanaugh has been called. What I find most inexcusable is this rush to judgment, the unwillingness to take these kinds of allegations at face value and look at them for what they are a real question of character 
for someone who is asking for a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. In 1991, Republicans belittled Professor Hill's experience, saying, and I quote, it won't make a bit of difference in the outcome, end quote. And the burden of proof was on Professor Hill. Today, our Republican colleagues are saying this is a hiccup. Dr. Ford is mixed up and declaring, I'll listen to the lady, but we're going to bring this to a close. What's worse, many of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have also made it clear that no matter what happens today, the Senate will plow right through and ensure Judge Kavanaugh would be elevated within a week. In fact, on Tuesday, the majority went ahead and scheduled a vote on the nomination before we heard one word of testimony regarding allegations of sexual assault and misconduct by Brett Kavanaugh. Republican leadership even told senators they should plan to be in over this weekend so the nomination can be pushed through without delay. This is despite the fact that in the last few days, two more women have come forward with their own serious allegations of sexual assault involving Brett Kavanaugh. This past Sunday, we learned about Debbie Ramirez, who was a student at Yale with Brett Kavanaugh. She too did not want to come forward, but after being approached by reporters, she told her story. She was at a college party where Kavanaugh exposed himself to her. She recalls pushing him away and then seeing him laughing and pulling his pants up. Then yesterday, Judy Swetnick came forward to say that she had experiences of being at house parties with Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge. She recounted seeing Kavanaugh engage, and I quote, in abusive and physically aggressive behavior toward girls, end quote, including attempts to, quote, remove or shift girls' clothing, end quote, not taking, quote, no for an answer, grabbing girls, quote, without their consent, end quote, and targeting, quote, particular girls so that they could be taken advantage of, end quote. Each of these stories are troubling on their own, and each of these allegations should be investigated by the FBI. All three women have said they would like the FBI to investigate. Please do so. All three have said they have other witnesses and evidence to corroborate their accounts. And yet, Republicans continue to blindly push forward. So, today we're moving forward with a hearing and being asked to assess the credibility of Brett Kavanaugh. He's made several statements about how his focus was on school, basketball, service projects, and going to church. He declared that he, quote, never, end quote, drank so much he couldn't remember what happened. And he has, quote, always treated women with dignity and respect, end quote. And while he has made these declarations, more and more people have come forward challenging his characterization of events and behaviors. James Roach, his freshman roommate at Yale, stated Kavanaugh was, and I quote again, frequently incoherently drunk, end quote. And that was when, he, quote, he became aggressive and belligerent, end quote, when he was drunk. Liz Swisher, a friend of his from Yale, said, and I quote, there's no medical way I can say that he was blacked out, but it's not credible for him to say that he has no memory lapses in the nights that he drank to excess, end quote. Lynn Brooks, a college classmate, said the picture Kavanaugh is trying to paint doesn't match her memories of him. And I quote, he's trying to paint himself as some kind of choir boy. You can't lie your way onto the Supreme Court. And with that statement out, he's gone too far. It's about the integrity 
of the institution, end quote. Ultimately, members and ladies and gentlemen, I really think that's the point. We're here to decide whether to evaluate this nominee to the most prestigious court in our country. It's about the integrity of that institution and the integrity of this institution. The entire country is watching how we handle these allegations. I hope the majority changes their tactics, opens their mind, and seriously reflects on why we are here. We are here for one reason, to determine whether Judge Kavanaugh should be elevated to one of the most powerful positions in our country. This is not a trial of Dr. Ford. It's a job interview for Judge Kavanaugh. Is Brett Kavanaugh who we want on the most prestigious court in our country? Is he the best we can do? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry you brought up about the unsubstantiated allegations of other people because we're here for the sole purpose of listening to Dr. Ford and we'll consider other issues uh, other times. Um, I, I would like to have you rise so I can swear you. Do you, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you very much. Please be seated, and before you give your statement, I, I want to say that uh, to everybody that she has asked uh, for uh, any time you ask for a break, uh, you get a break. Uh, any time there's something that you need you don't have, uh, just ask us. Uh, and uh, you can have as much time for your opening statement as you want. Uh, and uh, and uh, just uh, generally uh, let us know if there's any issues. Proceed, please. Thank you, Thank you Senator Grassley. I think after I read my opening statement, I anticipate needing some caffeine, if that is available. Okay. Can you pull the microphone just a little bit closer to you, please? Okay. Uh, uh, can the whole box go a little bit closer? I'm trying, to Senator. No. Okay. Well, then, then... I'll lean forward. Thank you. I could... Thank you. Okay. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Grassley and Rink... Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee. My name is Christine Blasey Ford. I am a professor of psychology at Palo Alto University and a research psychologist at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I won't detail my educational background since it has already been summarized. I have been married to Russell Ford since 2002 and we have two children. I am here today not because I want to be, I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. I have described the events publicly before. I summarized them in my letter to Ranking Member Feinstein and again in a letter to Chairman Grassley. I understand and appreciate the importance of your hearing from me directly about what happened to me and the impact that it has had on my life and on my family. I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I attended the Holton Arms School in Bethesda, Maryland from 1978 to 1984. Holton Arms is an all-girls school that opened in 1901. During my time at the school, girls at Holton Arms frequently met and became friendly with boys from all boys' schools in the area, including the Landon School, Georgetown Prep, Gonzaga High School, as well as our country clubs and other places where kids and families socialized. This is how I met Brett Kavanaugh, the boy who sexually assaulted me. During my freshman and sophomore school years, when I was 14 and 15 years old, my group of friends intersected with Brett and his friends for a short period of time. I had been friendly with a classmate of Brett's for a short time during my freshman and sophomore year. And it was through that connection that I attended a number of parties that Brett also attended. 
We did not know each other well, but I knew him and he knew me. In the summer of 1982, like most summers, I spent most every day at the Columbia Country Club in Chevy Chase, Maryland, swimming and practicing diving. One evening that summer, after a day of diving at the club, I attended a small gathering at a house in the Bethesda area. There were four boys I remember specifically being at the house. Brett Kavanaugh, Mark Judge, a boy named PJ, and one other boy whose name I cannot recall. I also remember my friend Leland attending I do not remember all of the details of how that gathering came together, but like many that summer, it was almost surely a spur-of-the-moment gathering. I truly wish I could be more helpful with more detailed answers to all of the questions that have and will be asked about how I got to the party and where it took place and so forth. I don't have all the answers, and I don't remember as much as I would like to, but the details that about that night that bring me here today are the ones I will never forget. They have been seared into my memory and have haunted me episodically as an adult. When I got to the small gathering, people were drinking beer in a small living room, family room type area on the first floor of the house. I drank one beer. Brett and Mark were visibly drunk. Early in the evening, I went up a very narrow set of stairs leading from the living room to a second floor to use the restroom. When I got to the top of the stairs, I was pushed from behind into a bedroom across from the bathroom. I couldn't see who pushed me. Brett and Mark came into the bedroom and locked the door behind them. There was music playing in the bedroom. It was turned up louder by either Brett or Mark once we were in the room. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. He began running his hands over my body and grinding into me. I yelled, hoping that someone downstairs might hear me. And I tried to get away from him, but his weight was heavy. Brett groped me and tried to take off my clothes. He had a hard time because he was very inebriated and because I was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath my clothing. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Both Brett and Mark were drunkenly laughing during the attack. They seemed to be having a very good time. Mark seemed ambivalent, at times urging Brett on, and at times telling him to stop. A couple of times I made eye contact with Mark and thought he might try to help me, but he did not. During this assault, Mark came over and jumped on the bed twice while Brett was on top of me. And the last time that he did this, we toppled over and Brett was no longer on top of me. I was able to get up and run out of the room. Directly across from the bedroom was a small bathroom. I ran inside the bathroom and locked the door. I waited until I heard Brett and Mark leave the bedroom, laughing and loudly walk down the narrow stairway, pinballing off the walls on the way down. I waited, and when I did not hear them come back up the stairs, I left the bathroom, went down the same stairwell, through the living room, and left the house. I remember being on the street and feeling an enormous sense of relief that I had escaped that house and that Brett and Mark were not coming outside after me. Brett's assault on me dr drastically altered my life. For a very long time, I was too afraid and ashamed to tell anyone these details. I did not want to tell my parents that I, at age 15, was in a house without any parents present, drinking beer with boys. 
I convinced myself that because Brett did not rape me, I should just move on and just pretend that it didn't happen. Over the years, I told very, very few friends that I had this traumatic experience. I told my husband before we were married that I had experienced a sexual assault. I had never told the details to anyone, the specific details, until May 2012 during a couple's counseling session. The reason this came up in counseling is that my husband and I had completed a very extensive, very long remodel of our home, and I insisted on a second front door, an idea that he and others disagreed with and could not understand. In explaining why I wanted a second front door, I began to describe the assault in detail. I recall saying that the boy who assaulted me could someday be on the US Supreme Court and spoke a bit about his background at an elitist all-boys school in Bethesda, Maryland. My husband recalls that I named my attacker as Brett Kavanaugh. After that May 2012 therapy session, I did my best to ignore the memories of the assault because recounting them caused me to relive the experience and caused panic and anxiety. Occasionally, I would discuss the assault in an individual therapy session, but talking about it caused more reliving of the trauma, so I tried not to think about it or discuss it. But over the years, I went through periods where I thought about the attack. I had confided in some close friends that I had had an experience with sexual assault. Occasionally, I stated that my assailant was a prominent lawyer or judge, but I did not use his name. I do not recall each person I spoke to about Brett's assault. And some friends have reminded me of these conversations since the publication of the Washington Post story on September 16, 2018. But until July 2018, I had never named Mr. Kavanaugh as my attacker outside of therapy. This changed in early July 2018. I saw a press reports stating that Brett Kavanaugh was on the short list of a list of very well qualified Supreme Court nominees. I thought it was my civic duty to relay the information I had about Mr. Kavanaugh's conduct so that those considering his nomination would know about this assault. On July 6th, I had a sense of urgency to relay the information to the Senate and the President as soon as possible before a nominee was selected. I did not know how specifically to do this. I called my congressional representative and let her receptionist know that someone on the president's shortlist had attacked me. I also sent a message to the encrypted Washington Post confidential tip line. I did not use my name, but I provided the names of Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge. I stated that Mr. Kavanaugh had assaulted me in the 1980s in Maryland. This was an extremely hard thing for me to do, but I felt that I couldn't not do it. Over the next two days, I told a couple of close friends on the beach in Aptos, California, that Mr. Kavanaugh had sexually assaulted me. I was very conflicted as to whether to speak out. On July 9th, I received a return phone call from the office of Congresswoman Anna Eshoo after Mr. Kavanaugh had become the nominee. I met with her staff on July 18th and with her on July 20th, describing the assault and discussing my fears about coming forward. Later, we discussed the possibility of sending a letter to Ranking Member Feinstein, who is one of my state's senators, describing what occurred. My understanding is that Representative Eshoo's office delivered a copy of my letter to Senator Feinstein's office on July 30th. The letter included my name, but also a request that it be kept confidential. My hope was that providing the information confidentially would be sufficient to allow the Senate to consider Mr. Kavanaugh's serious misconduct without having to make myself, my family, or anyone's family 
vulnerable to the personal attacks and invasions of privacy that we have faced since my name became public. In a letter dated August 31st, Senator Feinstein wrote that she would not share the letter without my explicit consent, and I appreciated this commitment. Sexual assault victims should be able to decide for themselves when and whether their private experience is made public. As the hearing date got closer, I struggled with a terrible choice. Do I share the facts with the Senate and put myself and my family in the public spotlight? Or do I preserve our privacy and allow the Senate to make its decision without knowing the full truth of his past behaviors? I agonized daily with this decision throughout August and September 2018. The sense of duty that originally motiva motivated me to reach out confidentially to the Washington Post and to Anna Eshoo's office when there was still a list of extremely qualified candidates and to Senator Feinstein was always there, but my fears of the consequences of speaking out started to exponentially increase. During August 2018, the press reported that Mr. Kavanaugh's confirmation was virtually certain. Persons painted him as a champion of women's rights and empowerment. And I believed that if I came forward, my single voice would be drowned out by a chorus of powerful supporters. By the time of the confirmation hearings, I had resigned myself to remaining quiet and letting the committee and the Senate make their decision without knowing what Mr. Kavanaugh had done to me. Once the press started reporting on the existence of the letter I had sent to Senator Feinstein, I faced mounting pressure. Reporters appeared at my home and at my workplace, demanding information about the letter in the presence of my graduate students. They called my bosses and co-workers and left me many messages, making it clear that my name would inevitably be released to the media. I decided to speak out publicly to a journalist who had originally responded to the tip I had sent to the Washington Post and who had gained my trust. It was important for me to describe the de details of the assault in my own words. Since September 16th, the date of the Washington Post story, I have experienced an outpouring of support from people in every state of this country. Thousands and thousands of people who have had their lives dramatically altered by sexual violence have reached out to share their experience and have thanked me for coming forward. We have received tremendous support from our friends and our community. At the same time, my greatest fears have been realized and the reality has been far worse than what I expected. My family and I have been the target of constant harassment and death threats, and I have been called the most vile and hateful names imaginable. These messages, while far fewer than the expressions of support, have been terrifying and have rocked me to my core. People have posted my personal information and that of my parents online on the internet. This has resulted in additional emails, calls, and threats. My family and I were forced to move out of our home. Since September 16th, my family and I have been visiting in various secure locales, at times separated and at times together, with the help of security guards. This past Tuesday evening, my work email was hacked and messages were sent out trying to recant my description of the sexual assault. Apart from the assault itself, these past couple of weeks have been the hardest of my life. I've had to relive this trauma in front of the world. And I've seen my life picked apart by people on television, on Twitter, so other social media, other media, and in this body who have never met me or spoken with me. I have been accused of acting out of partisan political motives. Those who say that do not know me. I am an independent person and I am no one's pawn. My motivation in coming forward was to be helpful and to provide facts about how Mr. Kavanaugh's actions have damaged my life, 
so that you could take into a serious consideration as you make your decision about how to proceed. It is not my responsibility to determine whether Mr. Kavanaugh deserves to sit on the Supreme Court. My responsibility is to tell you the truth. I understand that a professional prosecutor has been hired to ask me questions, and I'm committed to doing my very best to answer them. I have never been questioned by a prosecutor, and I will do my best. At the same time, because the committee members will be judging my credibility, I do hope to be able to engage directly with each of you. And at this point, I will do my best to answer your questions and would request some caffeine. A Coke or something? That sounds good. Thank that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I use my five minutes of questioning, um, I thought that I'd, I'd try to remind my colleagues, and in this case, Ms. Mitchell as well, that uh, uh, the five minutes, uh, the way I traditionally have done, if you ask a question uh, before your time runs out, and even though you go over your time as long as you aren't filibustering, uh, I, I'll let you ask your question, and I'm going to make sure that both uh, Dr. Ford and uh, uh, Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh, uh, as chairman of the committee, I know that they're going to get a chance to answer the questions fully uh, beyond that five minutes. But when that, uh, when uh, either Dr. Ford or Judge Kavanaugh uh, gets done, then we immediately go to the next person. So I hope that uh, that that will be done in a. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dr. Ford, I'm told that you want to break right now, and if you do, that's fine. I'm okay. I got the coffee. Thank you very much. I think I can proceed and sip no, on the coffee. Nobody can mix up my coffee right, so I. <laughs> so you're pretty fortunate. <clears throat> uh, so now, uh, with that, uh, uh, Ms. Mitchell. Uh, you have my five minutes to ask questions. Good morning, Dr. Ford. Hi. We haven't met. My name is Rachel Mitchell. Nice to meet you. I just wanted to tell you the, the first thing that struck me from your statement this morning was that you were terrified. And I just wanted to let you know I'm very sorry. Um, that's not right. Um, I know this is stressful. And so I would like to set forth some guidelines that maybe will alleviate that a little bit. Um, if I ask you a question that you don't understand, please ask me to clarify it or ask it in a different way. When I ask questions, sometimes I'll refer back to other information you've provided. If I do that and I get it wrong, please correct me. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to guess. I know it was a long time ago. If you do estimate, please let me know that you're estimating, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, we've put before you, and I'm sure you have copies of them anyway, five pieces of information, and I wanted to go over them. Um, the first is a screenshot of a WhatsApp texting between you and somebody at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Um, the first two texts were sent by you on July 6th, is that correct? Correct. And then the last one sent by you was on July 10th? Correct. Okay. Um, are those three comments accurate? I will read Take them, your time. yes. Thank you. Take your time. So there's one correction. Okay. Um, I've misused the word bystander as an adjective. Okay. Bystander means someone that is looking at an assault and, and uh, the person named PJ was not a, technically a bystander. I was writing very quickly with a sense of urgency. So I would not call him a bystander. He was downstairs and you know what I remember of him was he was a, a tall and very nice person. I didn't know him well but that he was downstairs not anywhere near the event. Okay. Thank you. For so I'd like to take that word out if it's possible. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, 
The second is the letter that you wrote to Senator Feinstein dated the July 30th of this year. Yes. Uh, did you write the letter yourself? I did. And uh, I, since it's dated July 30th, did you write it on that date? I believe so. I, I, it sounds right. I was in Rehoboth, Delaware at the time. Um, I could look into my calendar and try to figure that out. Um, I, was it written it seemed, on or about that day? Yes, yes. I traveled, I think, the 26th of July to Rehoboth, Delaware. So that makes sense because I wrote it from there. Okay. Is the letter accurate? I'll take a minute to read okay. it. So I'll, I'll, I can read fast. Take your time. Okay. Okay, so I have three areas that I'd like to address. Okay. Uh, in the second paragraph, where it says this, the assault occurred in a suburban Maryland area home. Yes. Um, at a gathering that included me and four others. I can't guarantee that there weren't a few other people there, but they are not in, um, in my purview of my memory. Would it be fair to say there were at least four others? Yes. Okay. What's the second correction? Oh, okay. The next sentence begins with, Kavanaugh physically pushed me into the bedroom. I would say I can't promise that Mark Judge didn't assist with that. I don't know. It was pushed from behind, so I don't want to put that solely on him. Okay. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, I don't know whether this is fair for me to interrupt, but I want to keep people within five minutes. Is that a is that a major problem for you in the middle of a question? Because I don't. We've got to. I've got to treat everybody the same. I understand that. Uh, and can I go to Senator Feinstein or do you? Yes, sir. I I'm sorry. I didn't see the okay. light was red. Please Senator do. Senator Feinstein. <clears throat> I didn't get the attention. So we're going to come back, back to that. Oh, okay. She comes back. I so see. Just make a, I see. Okay. For the benefit of Dr. Ford, I think she'll continue that after the five minutes yeah. here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I'd like to begin by putting some letters in the record. Without objection, so okay. ordered. Thank you. You, you want to tell me? <clears throat> 140 letters from friends and neighbors of the witness and a thousand female physicians across the country. Those are what the letters are. Oh, don't look at this. I want to thank you very much for your testimony. I know how very, very hard it is. Um, why, why have you held it to yourself all these years? As you look back, can you indicate what the reasons are? Well, I haven't held it in all these years. I did disclose it in the, in the confines of therapy where I felt like it was an appropriate place to cope with the sequelae of the event. Well, can you tell us what impact the events had on you? Um, well, I think that the sequelae of sexual assault varies by person. So for me personally, uh, anxiety, phobia, and PTSD-like symptoms are the types of things that I've been coping with. So um, more specifically, claustrophobia, panic, and that type of thing. Is that the reason for the second door, front door? Correct. Is claustrophobia? Correct. It doesn't, it, our house does not look aesthetically pleasing from the curb. 
I see. And do you have that second front door? Yes. It's, it, it, and and yes. it now is a place to host Google interns because we live near Google, so we get to ah, have ah. and other students can live. Can you tell us, is there any other way this has affected your life? Um, the primary impact was in the initial four years after the event. Um, I struggled academically. I struggled very much in Chapel Hill and in college. Uh, when I was 17 and went off to college, I had a very hard time, um, more so than others, uh, forming new friendships and uh, especially friendships with, with boys. Uh, and I had academic problems. What were the con when when we spoke, and it became very clear how deeply you felt about this and the need that you wanted to remain confidential? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So I was watching carefully throughout the summer. Well, my original intent, I just want to remind, was to communicate with everyone when there was still a list of candidates who all seemed to be, just from my perspective, from what I could read, equally qualified. And I was in a hurry to try to get the information forward, but didn't quite know how to do that. However, once he was selected and it seemed like he was popular and that the, it was an, a sure vote, I was calculating daily the, the risk benefit for me of coming forward and wondering whether I would just be jumping in front of a train that was headed to where it was headed anyway, and that I would just be personally annihilated. How did you decide to come forward? Uh, ultimately, because reporters were sitting outside of my home and fr t trying to talk to my dog through the window um, to calm the dog down, and a reporter appeared in my graduate classroom and I mistook her for a student and she came up to ask me a question and I thought that she was a student and it turned out that she was a reporter. So at that point I felt like enough was enough. People were calling my colleagues at Stanford and leaving messages on their voicemails and on their email saying that they knew my name. Clearly people knew my address because they were out in front of my house and it just, the mounting pressure, it seemed like it was time to just say I wanna, what I needed to say. I'm sorry. I want to ask you one question about the attack itself. Um, you are very clear about the attack, being pushed into the room. You say you don't know quite by whom, uh, but that it was Brett Kavanaugh that covered your mouth to prevent you from screaming, um, and then you escaped. How are you so sure that it was he? Uh, the same way that I'm sure that I'm talking to you right now, it's uh, just basic memory functions, um, and uh, also just the level of norepinephrine and epinephrine in the brain that sort of, as you know, encodes that neurotransmitter encodes memories into the hippocampus and so the trauma related experience then is kind of locked there whereas other details kind of drift. So what you are telling us is this could not be a case of identity. Absolutely not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Hatch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we were uh, stopped, you were going to tell us a third uh, correction that you wanted to make on that statement, or I'm sorry, the letter to uh, Senator Feinstein. It's, it wasn't a correction, but I just <coughs> wanted to comment on it since we were looking at this letter, mm -hmm. um, that I did see Mark Judge once at the Potomac Village Safeway after the time of the attack. Mm -hmm. And it would be helpful with anyone's resources if to figure out when he worked there, if people are wanting more details from me about when the attack occurred. If we could find out when he worked there, then I could provide a more detailed timeline as to when the attack occurred. Okay. And that, that is, so that is not a correction in your statement? It's just, no. Okay. Um, you also, uh, 
wrote out a handwritten statement for the polygrapher when you took your polygraph test. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I see corrections on that where you crossed out. So I will go on to the Washington Post article that was okay. originally published on September 16th of this year. And should I just not look at this for accuracy or we're just going to leave that be? We may okay. come back to it if okay. we need to refer to it. Okay. Um, on the Washington Post article, mm -hmm. um, did, did you submit to an interview by a reporter with the Washington Post for that article to be written? Correct. Okay. And then finally was the statement that you provided this morning. Uh, I assume that to the best of your recollection that that was accurate. That this whole article is accurate? No, no, no. The statement that you made this morning? Yes. Okay. I want to talk to you about the day that this happened mm -hmm. leading up to the gathering. Okay. In your statement this morning, have you told us everything that you remember about the day leading up to that? Yes. Let me ask just a few questions to make sure that you've thought of everything, okay? Um, you indicated uh, that you were at the country club swimming that day? That's my best estimate of how this could have happened. Okay. Um, and when you say best estimate, is that based on the fact that you said you went there pretty much every day? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall prior to getting there, so I'm, I'm only talking about up to the gathering, okay. had you had anything to drink? Not at all. Okay. Were you on any sort of medication? None. Okay. Do you recall knowing before you went who was going to be at that gathering? I recall that expecting that Mark Judge and Leland would be at that gathering. Okay. Uh, do you recall an expectation that Brett Kavanaugh would be there? I don't recall that whether or not I expected that. Okay. Now, let's talk about the gathering at, uh, up from the time you arrived till right when you went up the stairs, just that period of time, okay? Mm -hmm. What was the atmosphere like? at the gathering? Um, the, Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Judge were extremely inebriated. They had clearly been drinking prior and the other people at the party were not. Um, the living Can room I was... Can I ask you just to follow up on that? When you said it was clear that they had been drinking prior, do you mean prior to the time you had gotten there or prior to the time they had arrived? Pri prior to the time that they arrived. I don't recall who arrived first, though, whether it was me or them. Okay, please continue. Okay, so I recall that the, I, could, I can sketch a floor plan. Um, I recall that it was a spar sparsely furnished, fairly modest living room, uh, and it was not really a party, like the news has made it sound. Uh, it was not, it was just a gathering that I, assumed was going to lead to a party later on that those boys would attend because they tended to have parties later at night than I was allowed to stay out. So it was kind of a pre-gathering. Was it loud? No, not in the living room. Um, besides the music that you've described that was playing in the bedroom, was there any other um, music or television or anything like that that was adding? No. Okay, so there wasn't a stereo playing downstairs? No. Okay. Sir, Senator Lady, Dr. Ford, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, the, the way to make this inquiry truly credible is to do what we've always done when new information about a nominee comes to light. <coughs> to use your words this morning, uh, you want to reach the truth. The easy way to do that, ask the FBI to investigate. It's what we've always done. Let them investigate, report back to us. The same applies to the serious allegations made by uh, Deborah Ramirez and uh, Julie Swetnick. Let's have a nonpartisan professional investigation and then take the time to have these witnesses testify. Chairman, you and I were both here 27 years ago. 
At that time, the Senate failed Anita Hill. I said I believed her, but I'm concerned that we're doing a lot less for these three women today. That's my personal view. Now, Dr. Ford, no matter what happens with this hearing today, no matter what happens with this nomination, I know, and I hear from so many in my own state of Vermont, there are millions of victims and survivors out there who have been inspired by your courage. I am. Bravery is contagious. Indeed, that's the driving force behind the Me Too movement. And you sharing your story is going to have a lasting, positive impact on so many survivors in our country. And we owe you a debt of gratitude for that, Doctor. Now, some senators have suggested you were simply mixed up about who assaulted you. An ally of Judge Kavanaugh in the White House even promoted a wild theory about a Kavanaugh look-alike. You immediately rejected that theory, as did the innocent man who had been called that look-alike. In fact, he sent a letter to this committee forcefully rejecting this absurd theory, and I ask consent to enter that in the record. Without objection. Now, it, how did you know Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge? And is it possible that you would mix them up with somebody else? No, it is not. And the person that was uh, blamed for the incident is actually the person who introduced me to them originally. So he was a member of Columbia Country Club, and I don't want to talk about him because I think it's unfair, but he is the person that, that introduced me to them. But you, you would not mix up somebody else with Brett Kavanaugh, is that correct? Correct. Or Mark Judge. Correct. Well, then let's go back to the incident. What is the strongest memory you have? The strongest memory of the incident? Something that you cannot forget. Take whatever time you need. Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the, la the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense. You've never forgotten that laughter. You've never forgotten them laughing at you. They were laughing with each other. And you were the object of the laughter? I was, you know, underneath one of them while the two laughed. Two, fr two friends having a really good time with one another. Let me enter into the record uh, a statement by the National Task Force to End Domestic Violence. Without objection, so ordered. And a letter from 24 members of the House of Representatives urging the committee to use the NTF's trauma-informed approach in questioning Dr. Ford. And a letter from another 116 members of the House asking to uh, delay until all this has been heard. Without objection, so ordered. And Dr. Ford has at times been criticized for what she doesn't remember from 36 years ago. But we have numerous experts, including a study by the U.S. Army Military Police School Behavior Sciences Education that lapses of memory are wholly consistent with severe trauma and stress of assault. I'd ask consent that be entered. Without objection, so ordered. And Dr. Ford, I'll just conclude with this. You do remember what happened, do you not? Very much so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Graham, and then it's my understanding that, uh, that that's where you'd like to take a break. Does that work for you? Does that work for you as well? Uh, we, we're here to accommodate you, not oh, to accommodate you. us. I, I'm used to being collegial. So. Okay, go ahead, uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you told uh, Senator Feinstein in your letter that you and four others were present. You've corrected that today to say it was at least four others. When you were interviewed by the Washington Post, you said that there were four boys present at the party. 
Um, and then in your polygraph statement, you say there were four boys and two girls. When you say two girls, was that you and another, or was that two other girls? That was me and one other girl. And that other girl's name? Leland. Uh, Leland Kaiser now? Correct. Okay. Um, so then would it be fair to say at least PJ, Brett Kavanaugh, Mark Judge, Leland Ingram at the time, mm -hmm. And yourself were present, and possibly others. And one, one other boy. So there were four. There were four boys. I just don't know the name of the other boy. So. Have you been contacted by anybody saying, "Hey, I was at that party too"? No, I haven't okay. talked with anyone from that party. Okay. Now, you've you've been detailed about what happened once you got up the stairs, and so I don't need to go through that again. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I just realized that I said something that was inaccurate. I said I hadn't spoken with anyone from the party since that I've spoken with Leland. Okay. okay. Thank you for correcting yeah, that. I appreciate you. that. You've gone into detail about what happened once you went up the stairs, so I don't feel like it's necessary to go over those things again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Have you told us everything that you do remember about it? I believe so, but if there are other questions, I, will, I can attempt to answer them. Okay. Um, you said that the music was solely coming from that room, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And it was turned up once the three of you were inside that room, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, at some point, do you recall it being turned down? I don't remember if it was turned down once I was leaving the house. I don't remember. Okay. Likely, since I could hear them walking down the stairs very clearly from the bathroom. Okay. And the bathroom was, door was closed when you heard this, is that correct? I could hear them very clearly hitting the walls, okay. going down the stairwell. Um, in fact, in your letter, uh, you said that they went down the stairs and they were talking with other people mm -hmm. in the house. Correct. Uh, were you able to hear that conversation? I was not able to hear that conversation, but I was aware that they were downstairs and that I would have to walk past them to get out of the house. Okay. Now, let me make sure we're on the same page. Were you not able to hear the conversation or not able to understand the conversation? I couldn't hear the conversation. I was upstairs. Okay. How do you know there was a conversation? I'm just assuming since it was a social gathering, people were talking. I don't know. Okay. In I your letter, hear them you... talking as they went down the stairwell. They were laughing and. Okay. In your letter, you wrote both loudly stumbled down the stairwell. At which point, other persons at the house were talking with them. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell? Yes, I had to walk past everyone to leave the house. So, okay. I'm not, your letter. I'm not understanding. I'm sorry. Okay. Your um, next sentence. Let me try to clarify this. Uh, after you said other persons at the house were talking with them, the letter goes on with the very next sentence. I exited the bathroom, ran outside of the house, and went home. Correct. Okay. You said that you do not remember how you got home, is that correct? I do not remember. Okay. Other than I did not drive home. Okay. I'm going to sh show you if somebody could provide to you a map of uh, the various people's houses at the time and if you could verify that this is where you were living at the time. Where I was living at the time? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, do we have a copy of these documents? If you want one, we can get you one. Yes, before the questions begin so we can follow the testimony. Okay. My staff says that we should not provide the copy. No, nope. we will provide the copy. Oh. <laughs> we will provide the copy. Yeah. Well, speak plainly with me, please. Oh, sure. I'd no, like to see what you. she's My looking staff. at. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you have another 30 seconds now because I was rudely interrupted. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Harris, we do have a, a blown up copy of this for the members to view, if that's helpful. Okay, I'm going to put check marks next to homes that I can confirm 
are the correct locations and then an X or a question mark when I don't know where these people live. I'm only asking you to confirm if that map accurately shows where you were living at the where time. Where I lived at the time. So um, I can't see the street name, but I'm happy to refer to the address or the neighborhood. Okay. Could you tell us that? Yes. It's uh, River Falls. Okay. It's near the, like, uh, what is the place called? The Naval Research Center on uh, Clara Barton Parkway. Okay, was that a house or an apartment? It was my parents' home. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Durbin. Mr. Chairman, I ask consent to enter into the record um, letters of support for Dr. Ford from her classmates at Holton Arms School, 1,200 alumni of the school, 195 of your colleague students and mentors, 1,400 women who, and men who attended DC schools, and 50 members of the Yale Law School faculty who are calling for a full FBI investigation. I ask consent to enter these into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Dr. Ford, as difficult as this experience must be, I want you to know that your courage in coming forward has given countless Americans the strength to face their own life-shattering past and to begin to heal their wounds. By example, you have brought many families into an honest and sometimes painful dialogue that should have occurred a long time ago. I'm sorry for what this has done to you and your family. No one, no one should face harassment, death threats, and disparaging comments by cheap shot politicians simply for telling the truth. But you and your family should know that for every scurrilous charge and every pathetic tweet, there have been thousands of Americans, women and men, who believe you, support you, and thank you for your courage. Watching your experience, it's no wonder that many sexual assault survivors hide their past and spend their lives suffering in pain silence. You had absolutely nothing to gain by bringing these facts to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The fact that you are testifying here today, terrified though you may be, the fact that you have called for an FBI investigation of this incident, the fact that you are prepared to name both Judge Kavanaugh and eyewitness Mark Judge stands in sharp contrast to the obstruction we've seen on the other side. The FBI should have investigated your charges as they did in the Anita Hill hearing, but they did not. Mark Judge should be subpoenaed from his Bethany Beach hideaway and required to testify under oath, but he has not. Judge Kavanaugh, if he truly believes there's no evidence, no witnesses that can prove your case, should be joining us in demanding a thorough FBI investigation, but he has not. Today, you come before this committee and before this nation alone. I know you're joined by counsel and family. The prosecutor on the Republican side will continue to ask questions to test your memory and veracity. After spending decades trying to forget that awful night, it's no wonder your recollection is less than perfect. A polished liar can create a seamless story, but a trauma survivor cannot be expected to remember every painful detail. That's what Senator Leahy has mentioned earlier. One question is critical. In Judge Kavanaugh's opening testimony, which we will hear after you leave, this is what he says. I never had any sexual or physical encounter of any kind with Dr. Ford. I am not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person in some place at some time. Last night, the Republican staff of this committee released to the media a timeline that shows that they've interviewed two people who claim they were the ones who actually assaulted you. I'm asking you to address this new defense of mistaken identity directly. Dr. Ford, with what degree of certainty do you believe Brett Kavanaugh assaulted you? 100%. 100%. In the letter which you sent to Dr. Feinstein, or Senator Feinstein, you wrote, I have not knowingly seen Kavanaugh since the assault. I did see Mark Judge once at the Potomac Village Safeway where he was extremely uncomfortable in seeing me. Would you please describe that encounter at the Safeway with Mark Judge and what led you to believe he was uncomfortable? Yes, I was going to the Potomac Village Safeway. This is the one on the corner of Falls and River Road. And I was with my mother and I was a teenager, so I wanted her to go in one door and me go in the other. So um, 
I chose the wrong door because the door I chose was the one where Mark Judge was, uh, looked like he was working there and uh, arranging the shopping carts. And I said hello to him. And his face was white uh, and very uncomfortable saying hello back. Uh, and we had previously been friendly at the times that we saw each other over the pe previous two years, albeit not very many times, we had always been friendly with one another. Um, I wouldn't characterize him as not friendly. He was just nervous and not really wanting to speak with me. How and he, he looked a little bit ill. How long did this occur after the incident? Uh, I would estimate six to eight weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we take a break, uh, I can't let what Durbin, Senator Durbin said, by the way, he's my friend, we work on a lot of legislation together, but uh, you talked about the obstruction from the other side. I ca cannot let it go by what you've heard me say so many times, that between July 30th and September 13th, there were 45 days this committee could have been investigating this situation, and uh, her privacy would have been protect, protected. So something happened here in between on your side that the whole country, well, not the whole country should have known about it. No, not know about it. We should have investigated it. We'll take a break now for 15 minutes. All right, that concludes the first round of questioning where they're taking a short break here. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford has been describing this night in uh, very detailed moments. Gail King is, of course, here, and Jan Crawford. Jan, let's start with you. What was your uh, takeaway from this first round? Well, I mean, it, when we first saw her, it was her demeanor and her voice. It's her uh, voice, it's, me too, Jen. It's so girlish and yes. childlike. I was, I was not expecting that when you were just looking at her. I, we had no idea what to expect. But the, the tone and tenor of her voice and even her mannerisms and the way she interacts with the committee seems very girlish to me as well. And then moving away from kind of her demeanor and her testimony her, her, that she read from her statement and then in her responses to the questions. I think it's very interesting to see how the um, Republican questioner is handling it. She's kind of lay, she's building a case almost. I mean, she's methodically taking her through the events of that day. And then you go to the Democratic senators who are going straight for uh, anything that they think might prove her case. And so they're kind of asking these big picture questions, confronting what they expect might be defenses from Judge Kavanaugh, which is, of course, you don't remember. Do you think I mean, of course, you remember it was all, him. All of them have in their first question asked, how can you be sure? So sure. And they've asked it in three different ways. Wait, maybe, how can you be sure then maybe it was somebody else? What level of specificity, Senator Durbin asked, do you have in the, that it was Kavanaugh? She said 100%. And they're fronting that. Yeah. They're, they're diffusing what they anticipate to be something that she, uh, Ms. Miller, is trying to build. I do think it's interesting the way it's being done, that she's building a case, and then when the Democrats ask the question, they hit us with a wall of emotion. The thing that she, that she said, she had a comment about the thing that affected her the most. I love Senator Patrick Leahy. I was very struck by his question when he said to her, what is it that has stuck out in your mind all these years later? And I thought it was very, her response to that I thought was very powerful. I don't know if we, we have we, that clip or should we, we just do. talk about it? I think we have okay, it. Let's, let's hear that. Let's roll. What is the strongest memory you have? Strongest memory of the incident, something that you cannot forget. Take whatever time you need. Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the, la the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense. I thought that was a very powerful statement coming from her. You, yeah, John? That's absolutely right. And also, uh, when she talks about the hippocampus, yes. she is a professor of psychology, and she is, in her testimony from time to time, talked about the way the brain works. Certainly, some of the questioning of her testimony, at least in the papers, has been how can she be so specific about some things and unspecific about others? And she is tutoring in the brain science while she's explaining, and I think being quite meticulous in saying, this is the very limit of my memory, and this is what I don't know about. And be 
being so particularly detailed. And what strikes me there is one of the claims against her has been, well, this is all a last minute ploy by the, the opposition party, by the Democrats. Nobody could carry out this sustained and this detailed a description of things if they'd made it up out of whole cloth for, for political purposes at the last minute. And the development overnight that two other men have come forward to say, listen, it wasn't Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge, that it was us, that she's been asked a couple of times now, how can you be so sure? And who's asking her that? And, yes, the Democrats. The Democrats mm -hmm. are they're asking letting her. Right. They're, they're putting that out there because they anticipate they're going to hear that later, and she's already explained it now. And I think what we see next is you have Ms. Mitchell trying to kind of take her methodically through this day. And as you watch this unfold, the sense as a viewer is, and the American people who are watching is, where is she going with this? Yes. When is the aha? We're, so now people are on the edge of their seats in a way thinking there's going to be an aha moment where there is a point to this. And it's not well, clear what that is. Or is say, there one? Jan, she does seem to be leading us to something. Mm -hmm. But, it but seems, is she? Or is she? Oh, She seems to be going somewhere. I'm just not quite sure where. I keep thinking, mm -hmm. is she walking? Is she trying to catch her on something? Or is she trying to revive her memory to say, well, this time you said that, but now you're saying this. I feel that there's some kind of moment she's building, too. I, I was also interested in terms of this, you know, the politics that is uh, hanging over this, that is infusing this whole thing. We should, let's see if we can take a look at what, at what Dr. Ford said in her opening statement about her, uh, the political angle here. I have been accused of acting out of partisan political motives. Those who say that do not know me. I am an independent person and I am no one's pawn. My motivation in coming forward was to be helpful and to provide facts about how Mr. Kavanaugh's actions have damaged my life so that you could take into a serious consideration as you make your decision about how to proceed. It is not my responsibility to determine whether Mr. Kavanaugh deserves to sit on the Supreme Court my responsibility is to tell you the truth. There she was, recognizing she's in a political atmosphere, but saying clearly, I am speaking with my own voice. But she also made it clear, guys, she does not want to be here. The only reason that she's here is because the media has discovered who she is. You know, I have to say, the media doesn't sound so great the way she said they bombarded her house. Even at one point, talking to her dog through the window, they showed up at her class. Somebody who she thought was a graduate student was actually a reporter asking questions. They've called her colleagues, they've contacted her parents. And she made it clear that once she had been bombarded like that and exposed, she felt she had to speak up. But she's making it very clear from the beginning she does not want to be sitting in this seat today. That's right. Let's bring Nora in. She is uh, on Capitol Hill. She has been watching every turn of this as well. Nora, what's, what do you take away from what we've seen so far? Well, I think, Gail, you, you hit the nail on the head there. She called it her civic duty multiple times during her testimony, pointing out that she was an independent person. Um, and then she was conflicted, was the word she used, about coming forward, that she wanted to remain private. But I think specifically on the question of credibility, which we have talked about from the very beginning, because there is no contemporaneous evidence at the time. This is a question of credibility. And so that's why you see the Democrats questioning so pointed on that very much. And her answers also specific, where she refers to physiological evidence. When she mentioned indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter. At another point, when Feinstein asked her, are you sure that it was Brett Kavanaugh? She said, yes, as sure as I am right now, basic memory functions, also the le level of norepinephrine and epinephrine in the brain that codes memory. So she is specifying how memory is made within the body in order to say this can be true because that is what we know about trauma, that it creates an imprint on the brain. And that furthers this idea of credibility, how she remembers it so clearly, and perhaps those who are also there may not remember it as clearly. Nancy Cordes and I have been sitting side by side <laughs> watching all of this as it goes on and the credibility of this witness. And there was one very fascinating moment, Nora, where she was asked about this notion of mistaken identity that some conservatives have, have put 
pushed. In fact, at one point, a conservative judicial activist even named someone uh, on social media who might have been the perpetrator instead. And she said, no, you know how I know it wasn't that person? Because he's the person who introduced me to Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh in the first place. That was news. That was that news. Was news. And, and it's, it's the reason that every single Democrat has been asking her, are you sure? Are you sure? Because at the end of the day, what all this comes down to is, are there a handful of Republicans that believe her account rather than Judge Kavanaugh's? If they do, then they have a very difficult decision to make. Do they think that something like this that happens when you are a minor is disqualifying? And so that is the main focus, at least for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, Gail and John, too, when you look at what has happened this morning. The Republican senators, and they're all males on the Senate Judiciary Committee, except for Senator Grassley, have thus far remained silent. That's well, right. They set it up that way by bringing in a female prosecutor to to question her. Yeah. You know, both both Nora and, and Nancy are talking about credibility. And Lisa Senator Murkowski said this two days ago. We are now in a place where it's not about whether or not Judge Kavanaugh is qualified. Is it about whether or not a woman is to be believed? And when you look at uh, Dr. Ford. It would seem that many people, I'm getting reaction, of course, on Twitter and people who are just reaching out saying she's coming across very credibly. What do you say, Jan? Absolutely. I mean, and she looked, but I think we have to remember that is, that's what we expected. I mean, I think we expected her to come across as credible. And, and whether or not you doubt the veracity of her claims, uh, I haven't seen anyone suggesting that she just made this up now to do in Kavanaugh. Okay. No, I don't think anybody well, thought she'd no, make so it up, but it is about your presentation. You know, and the fact that she's you can tell she's extremely nervous even before she started and while she's talking. But I do think implicit in some of the claims that this came up at the 11th hour right. is to implant the notion that this was all concocted, her, you know, helter-skelter to kind of stop the nomination. Right, and so, and I, th yes, and so then I see the, it's hard to kind of make that argument watching her testify right now with, with the demeanor that she has, this kind of girlish, she seems very much like you could see her in that house in 1982. You could see her testimony. You can picture her yeah. as yes. a 15-year-old girl. Yes, very um, so. But I, as we kind of, as we, this is only the beginning of this hearing. I think yes. we have to keep in mind yes. uh, we have a long way to go today. Yes. And if you recall, when Anita Hill started testifying in 1991, she, people were shocked who were supporting Justice Thomas that she looked credible. That she came across as very believable. So um, we, we have to kind of, I think we have to listen to, well, as we will. We, mm -hmm. There's a long way to go in this Does day. that take us, Jan, yeah. then back to this initial question, which is, where do you start out in, in addressing these questions? In the, in the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas case, a lot of people thought where they all started out was you sort of believe the man. And so then when you see all the testament, you have pre-sorted it in your worldview. Now the worldview has changed and is, in, as, is changing as we speak almost in this very moment. Uh, and therefore, does when you're taking in this information, does it become all about whether you listen to women? Which means it really isn't about the facts of that night. It's about this larger cultural question of whether women should be heard and that this then becomes a verdict on that mm -hmm. uh, rather than what happened in that specific night. Ed O'Keefe, I'm told, is standing outside the hearing room and has some uh, comments he'd like to make. Ed? Hi, Gail. Just actually some reporting uh, that we have from here in the hallway outside the room. Uh, Ch Chairman Grassley and the Republicans, along with Rebecca Mitchell, the prosecutor, are in another room across the hall during this break. And as he went in, uh, Chairman Grassley was asked by reporters what he makes of this so far. And he said, quote, I know we have to take her very seriously. They're all in there uh, waiting out this break. Uh, certainly emotional, gripping testimony. I'd argue some of the most emotional Capitol Hill has probably ever seen, at least in the modern era. And we have some details from what was going on in the room uh, while Dr. Ford was testifying and answering. Remember, reporters can't be in there in large numbers because it's a smaller room. So we all have producers in there who are sending out notes as it happens, and there's no cutaway camera George, to show you the reaction of people along the dais. But we know that when Dr. Ford was describing the alleged incident at the party with Judge Kavanaugh, uh, several senators, Republican senators, leaned forward in their chair as she was describing it. Uh, Jeff Flake, especially, we're told by producer Jack Turman, looked like he was struggling, sad, and disgusted. 
arrested. Flake constantly looked down and had his chin resting on his hand on a few occasions. The prosecutor, Mitchell, listened intently, took notes, and was reading over papers on her desk. And when Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont said that he is, quote, inspired by your courage to Dr. Ford, uh, that seemed to cause some emotion among people in the room. We know that the actress Alyssa, Alyssa Milano is here as a guest of Diane Feinstein. When Leahy said that, she apparently took a tissue up to her eyes. And Senator Kirsten Gillibrand in New York, who's not a member of the Judiciary Committee, but is in the room, also smiled widely when Senator Leahy said that. We expect the testimony to continue uh, in just a few minutes. A 15-minute break on Capitol Hill usually turns into about a 25-minute break, so don't be surprised if it stretches a little longer. And as Jan said, people up here expect this is going to go most of the afternoon. All right, Ed O'Keefe, we thank you very much. Alyssa Milano, of course, the actress who's very prominent in the Me Too movement. Let's go back to Nora. Let's just underscore what's just happened. And Jan is right to, to point out that this is going to be a long hearing and to watch both sides of this story. But already, Christine Blasey Ford has said she is 100% sure that Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her. And that's something that later this afternoon we're going to hear Brett Kavanaugh deny. The issue of credibility and who people believe is all this is about. There is no investigation. There's no contemporaneous evidence. And to those who say that no one has doubted um, her account, that's just not true. Now, those close to Kavanaugh have been saying maybe she was sexually assaulted, but it wasn't Brett Kavanaugh. But there have been some Republicans up here on Capitol Hill who have suggested that she made it up, right, Nancy? And that she had a motivation for lying, Nora. We have had senators tell us all week that uh, perhaps she had help making up this story. Um, uh, I asked Senator Orrin Hatch, who's there in the hearing room yesterday, when you say that this is a smear campaign, aren't you implying not just that she's mistaken, but that she's lying? And he said, well, a lot of people feel that way. Uh, and he said, it doesn't reflect very well on these women who have come forward. So clearly, there has been an effort um, among some Republicans to undermine their credibility and their motivations. And so the question is, after seeing her in this courtroom, or in this hearing room that sometimes feels like a courtroom, do they change their strategy? There was something Senator Feinstein said in her opening statement um, that I tweeted out and I think sort of characterizes in some ways how they see that, which is that she said, this is not a trial for Dr. Ford. This is a job interview for Brett Kavanaugh. And it is a job interview for Brett Kavanaugh. That's what these confirmation processes are. So the last set of hearings were about his judicial jurisprudence, right? How he might rule, his past rulings. That was at case. Today, what's at case at, at, at uh, being debated is his character. We know how he might rule, how he's ruled in the past. Today is about the character of this individual and how perhaps how he acted in high school and college uh, may shine the light on what kind of person he is and whether he should sit on the highest court in the land. But let's be clear, Dr. Ford thus far has come across very credible, and she says she is 100% sure that it was Brett Kavanaugh. Right, and from the most basic political level, what we're watching for is do two Republicans out of the 51 Republicans in the Senate believe her story and believe that this is disqualifying? Because if they do and they say they're going to vote no, assuming all Democrats vote no as well, he doesn't have the votes. So Senator Susan Collins and Senator Lisa Murkowski is who you're talking about, those two Republicans. What have we known that, about what they've said in terms of what they would be watching for in listening to Dr. Ford? Well, we know that uh, Lisa Murkowski has expressed some concern just in the past couple of days about the lack of an independent investigation. As you know, Republicans have been adamant that the Senate Judiciary Committee can conduct its own investigation, even though it is a very polarized committee, just like the rest of Congress. Um, they have really pushed back on the notion of an FBI investigation. She has started to say maybe that's not the right idea. Senator Susan Collins has expressed concerns about the fact that Mark, Mark Judge, who has been repeatedly referenced in this committee, this morning, uh, yeah. has not been subpoenaed. She wants to know why no one has tried to speak with him in an, uh, you know, under oath or in some other type of setting rather than just taking his word for it in a letter that he doesn't remember 
anything. And then there are other Republicans. You know, there are Republicans who have come out in uh, in favor of Kavanaugh in the past, but there's no reason why they couldn't see what's happening now and say, you know, I've got new information. I've changed my mind. I just wonder how Brett Kavanaugh is going to answer this. I mean, she says she's 100 percent sure that it was him. What does he say in response to that? That what yeah and that you're right that has been put out there that it was a mistaken identity mm -hmm. and the news this morning uh, that two Republican excuse me that two men had called into the Republicans and said it was actually me we spoke to Senator Lindsey Graham this morning and he called them he called one of them a crazy loon and he said I just don't believe him and I and this is Senator Graham who is in Kavanaugh's camp he said this stuff comes in all the time these anonymous people calling and stuff even Senator Graham said I don't believe these two men who called in and said they were the men who were part of the mistaken identity well here's the advantage that Kavanaugh has is that he knows a lot of the senators who are on this committee and has known them for a decade or more he's a, a sitting judge uh, they have confirmed him for that role in the past he's well known in legal circles here in Washington DC and well respected and on that basis, they have been saying for a couple of weeks now, I believe him, I know him, I can't see him doing anything like this. And after all of this is over, no matter how credibly she comes across, assuming that he does too, they may say, you know what, I still think that, that, you know, that he's telling the truth. I think one other thing, just as we talk about what's happening here in the United States Senate, is just take a step back in what's happening around the country. Because even just outside this hearing room, you have hundreds of young women who are watching this uh, streaming on their phones. And reports that we've seen from outside, some of them crying, that women who have experienced sexual assault themselves, who have friends and family members, are also viewing this in a different type of lens because they didn't report it in the past, because they didn't believe anyway. So that's why we've talked about this not only as sort of a cultural moment of why so many people are glued into these hearings today, because it is a question of credibility and who to believe and the fact that 36 years later, Dr. Ford felt that it was, in her words, her civic duty to air this. And as we see now, she's returned now from from this this break and let's return now to inside these hearing room break for 1205 this last break came just a little bit later i didn't call it at the right time we're going to have a vote at 1240 so would it be possible for you to go from now until 1240 without a break okay uh, yes yeah okay now it is uh, senator cornyn's time so proceed miss mitchell Thank you, Senator. Um, I have a blow up here to my right of the map that was shown to you. Um, the address that's indicated on here as belonging to your family is what all the property tax records showed as being your address. Okay. Just to put it in perspective, I'd like to show you a, a further out, a zoomed out picture so that uh, we can put it in perspective. So we can show the greater Washington area. Of course, you can see the beltway on that, the beltway area. Okay. And uh, then number three, if we could look at that. We, uh, we drew a one-mile radius around the country club, and then we calculated from the furthest Mr. point. Mr. Chairman, again, we don't have these documents. No, we're not. That's why she showed three different documents, because they depict three different things. So we'd like to see all three documents, please, so we can follow along. She, uh, proceed, please. Okay. Um, looking at uh, number, the third thing here, mm -hmm. uh, we calculated the distance from the closest point to your house from a mile radius of the country club um, and then the farthest point. You can see it's, it's 6.2 and, of course, 8.2 miles. Mm -hmm. um, and you've described this as being near the country club, wherever this house was. Is that right? I would describe it as be somewhere between my house and the country club in that vicinity that's shown in your picture. Okay. And the country club is about 20, a 20-minute 20 drive from my parents' home. A 20-minute drive. And, of mm -hmm. course, I've, I've marked yeah. as the crow flies. Yes. Um, would it be fair to say that somebody drove you somewhere either to the party or home from the party? Correct. Okay. Has anyone come forward to say to you, hey, remember, I was the one that drove you home? No. Okay. Um, in your July 6th text to the Washington Post, 
that you looked at earlier, you said that this happened in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. In your letter to Senator Feinstein, you said it occurred in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. In your polygraph statement, you said it was uh, high school summer in 80s, and you actually had written in, and this is one of the corrections I referred to early, and then you crossed that out. Um, later in your interview with the Washington Post, uh, you were more specific. You believed it occurred in the summer of 1982, and you said the end of your sophomore year. Yes. Um, you said the same thing, I believe, in your prepared statement. How were you able to narrow down the time frame? I can't give the exact date, and um, I would like to be more helpful about the date, and if I knew when Mark Judge worked at the Potomac Safeway, then I would be able to be more helpful in that way. So I'm just using um, memories of when I got my driver's license. I was 15 at the time, and I, I did not drive home from that party or to that party. And once I did have my driver's license, I liked to drive myself. So um, I assume the legal driving age was 16? Yes. Okay. Now, you've um, talked about attending therapy. Um, in your text to the, the Washington Post dated 7-6, mm -hmm. so that's the very first statement we have from you, you put in there, quote, have therapy records talking about it. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I understand that. Did you already have your therapy records at that time? I had looked at them online to see if they existed, yes. Okay, so this was something that was... Uh, available to you via a computer, like a, a patient portal? Actually, no, it was in the office of a provider. Okay. She helped me go through the record to locate whether I had uh, had record of this conversation that I had remembered. Did you show a full or partial set of those marriage therapy records to the Washington Post? Um, I don't remember. I remember summarizing for her what they said. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I actually gave her the record. Okay. Um, so it's possible that the reporter did not see these notes. Um, I don't know if she's, I can't recall whether she saw them directly or if I just told her what they said. Um, have you shown them to anyone else besides counsel, your counsel? Just the counsel. Okay. Uh, would it be fair to say that Brett Kavanaugh's name is not listed in those notes? His name is not listed in those notes. Would it also be fair to say that the therapist's notes that we've been talking about say that there were four boys in the room? Um, it describes the uh, sexual assault and it says uh, erroneously by four boys, so the therapist got the content of it wrong. And you corrected that to the Washington Post reporter, correct? Correct. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Blasey Ford. A lot of people are proud of you today. Um, from a prosecutor's eye view, one of the hardest things that uh, we have to do is to speak to somebody who's come forward with an allegation of sexual assault and let them know that we can't provide the evidence to go forward to trial. It's a hard day for the prosecutor to do that. And so both because making a sincere and thorough investigative effort is such an important consolation to the victim in that circumstance and because it's what you're obliged to do professionally Sincere and thorough investigation is critical to these claims in a prosecutor's world. It may be the most basic thing that we owe a victim or a witness coming forward is to make sure that we give them a full, thorough, and sincere investigation. You have met all of the standards of what I might call preliminary credibility with your uh, initial statement. Um, you have uh, vivid, specific, and detailed recollections, something prosecutors look for. Your uh, recollections are consistent with known facts. Um, you made prior consistent statements, something else uh, prosecutors and lawyers look for. You were willing to and, and did take a lie detector test. And you were willing to testify 
here. Here you are, subject to professional cross-examination by a prosecutor. So you've met any condition uh, any prosecutor could expect to go forward, and yet there has been no sincere or thorough investigation of your claims. You specifically asked for an FBI investigation, did you not? Yes. And are you aware that when the FBI begins investigating, they might find corroborative evidence and they might find exculpatory evidence? I don't know what exculpatory evidence is. It, is. Uh, not helpful to your uh, recollection and, and version of events, helpful to the accused? Understood, yes. So it could go either way? Yes. And you were still not just willing, but insistent that the FBI should investigate your recollection and your claim? Yes, I feel like it would, I could be more helpful in that, if that was the case, in providing some of the details that maybe people are wanting to know about. And, and as we know, they didn't. And I submit that never, never in the history of background investigations has an investigation not been pursued when new, credible, derogatory information was brought forward about the nominee or the candidate. I don't think this has ever happened in the history of FBI background investigations. Maybe somebody can prove me wrong, but it's wildly unusual and out of character. And uh, in my view, it is a grave disservice to you, and I want to take this moment to apologize to you for that, and to report to anybody who might be listening that when somebody's willing to come forward, even under those circumstances, even having been not given the modicum of courtesy and support of a proper investigation, um, you've shown yourself particularly proud uh, in, in doing that. And the responsibility for the decision to have this be, I think, the only background investigation in history to be stopped as derogatory information came forward belongs with 13 men. The President, Director Ray of the FBI, and the 11 members of the majority of this committee. As to the committee's investigation, the fact that uh, Mr. Kavanaugh's alleged accomplice has not been subpoenaed, has not been examined and cross-examined under oath, has not been interviewed by the FBI, tells you all you need to know about how credible this performance is. The very bare minimum that a person who comes forward is owed is sincere and thorough investigation, and you've been denied that, and I will make a personal pledge to you here that however long it takes, in whatever forum I can do it, whenever it's possible, I will do whatever is in my power to make sure that your claims get a full and proper investigation, and not just this. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Since this issue's come up so many times, I'd like to comment. Uh, the New Yorker published an anonymous account of allegations September the 14th. Two days later, Dr. Ford identified herself as the victim in a Post article detailing her allegations. I immediately directed my staff to investigate. September the 17th, Dr. Ford's counsel went on several television shows requesting that her client have an opportunity to tell her story. The same day, I scheduled a hearing for Monday, September the 24th, giving Dr. Ford a week to prepare her testimony and come to Washington, D.C. On September the 17th, committee investigative staff uh, reached out to Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh to schedule follow-up interviews with Republican and Democrat investigators. Judge Kavanaugh accepted the opportunity to speak to the investigators under criminal penalty. Uh, Dr. Ford declined. In his interview on September the 17th, Judge Kavanaugh denied the allegations and requested a hearing as soon as possible. Democratic staff refused to participate in that interview. The next day, September the 18th, committee investigative staff contacted Mark Judge requesting an interview. Committee staff also learned the identity of two other alleged party goers and requested interviews. Mark Judge submitted a statement 
uh, under penalty of felony, uh, denying knowledge of the party described by Dr. Ford, and states that he never saw Brent uh, at the, uh, in the manner described by Dr. Ford. And uh, I can go on and on about that, but uh, we got to realize that what we have done in this case, uh, all the time you go through a background investigation by the FBI, then it comes to us. And there's always some holes in it that we have to follow up on. And besides, Mr. Chairman, we're responding to uh, Dr. Ford's request to tell her s story. That's why we're here. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Mitchell, go for uh, Mr. Chairman. I just want to point out that to support what Senator Whitehouse said in the Anita Hill case. Can we hear from uh, Dr. F Dr. Ford? George Bush ordered that the uh, investigation be opened again. Ms. Mitchell, will you proceed for uh, Dr. for Senator Lee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Ford, um, the Washington Post reported in their uh, September 16th article that you did show them therapist notes. Is that incorrect? I don't remember physically showing her a note. Okay. Perhaps my counsel did. I don't. I don't remember physically showing her my copy of the note. Okay. But I. I just don't remember. So I'm sorry. I have retrieved a physical copy of those medical records. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, you also attended individual therapy. Uh, did you show any of those notes to the reporter from the Washington Post? Again, I don't remember if I showed her like something that I summarized or if I just spoke about it um, or if she saw it in my counsel's office. I can't, I, I don't know for sure, but I certainly spoke with her about the 2013 record with the individual therapist. And Brett Kavanaugh's name is not in those notes, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, in reading the Washington Post article, it mentions that this incident that we're here about contributed to anxiety and PTSD problems with which you have struggled. The word contributed, does that mean that there are other things that have happened that have also contributed to anxiety and PTSD? I think that's a great question. I think the etiology of anxiety and PTSD is multifactorial. So um, that was certainly a critical risk, risk that uh, we would call it a risk factor in science. So that would be a predictor of the symptoms that I now have. Uh, it doesn't mean that other things that have happened in my life would, have, would make it worse or better. There are other risk factors as well. So have there been other things then that have contributed to the anxiety and PTSD that you suffered? Well, I think there's sort of biological predispositions that everyone in here has for particular disorders. So I can't rule out that I would have some biological predisposition to be what you know, about an anxious type person. What about environmental? Um, environmentally, uh, not that I can think of. Certainly no, nothing as striking as that event. Okay. In your interview with the Washington Post, you said that you told your husband early in your marriage that you had been a victim of, and I quote, physical abuse. In your statement, you said that before you were married, you told him that you had experienced, quote, a sexual assault. Do these two things refer to the same incident? Yes. And at either point on these two times, did you use any names? No. Okay. May I ask Dr. Ford, how did you get to Washington? In an airplane. Okay. It's, I asked that because it's been reported by the press that you would not submit to an interview with the committee because of your fear of flying. Is, is that true? Well, I was willing, I was hoping that they would come to me, but then I uh, realized that was an unrealistic request. It would have been a quicker trip for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, that was certainly what I was hoping was to avoid having to get on an airplane, but I eventually was able to uh, get up the gumption with the help of some friends and get on the plane. Okay. When you were here in uh, the mid-Atlantic mid area back in uh, 
August, uh, end of July, August. How did you get here? Also by airplane. I come here once a year during the summer to visit my family. Okay. I'm sorry, not here. I go to Delaware. Okay. Thanks. Um, in fact, you fly fairly frequently for your hobbies and your, you've had to fly for your work. Is that true? Correct, unfortunately. Um, you, you were a consulting biostatistician in Sydney, Australia. Is that right? I've never been to Australia, but the company that I worked for is based in Australia, and they have an office in San Francisco, California. Okay. I, I don't think I'll make it to Australia. <laughs> it is long. Um, I also saw on your CV that you list the following interests of surf travel, and you, in parentheses, put Hawaii, Costa Rica, South Pacific Islands, and French Polynesia. Have you been all to those places? Correct. By airplane? Yes. And your interests also include oceanography, uh, Hawaiian and Tahitian culture. Did you travel by air as a part of those interests? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Easier for me to travel going that direction when it's a vacation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ford. Uh, you know, in my old job as a prosecutor, we investigated reports like this. So it gave me a window on the types of cases that hurt women and hurt all of us. And I would always tell the women that came before us that they were going to have to tell their story before a jury box of strangers. And you've had to tell your story before the entire nation. For so many years, people swept cases like yours under the rug. They'd say what happens inside a house didn't belong in the courthouse. Well, the times have changed. So I just want to thank you for coming forward today and for sharing your report with us. Now, I understand that you've taken a polygraph test. Dr. Ford, um, that found that you were being truthful when you described what happened to you. Can you tell us why you decided to take that test? I was uh, meeting with attorneys, I was interviewing various attorneys, and the attorneys uh, asked if I was willing to take it, and I said absolutely. That said, it was almost as anxiety-provoking as an airplane flight. Okay. Um, and you've talked about your recollections um, and seeing Mark Judge at that Safeway. If there had been an appropriate reopening of this background check and FBI interviews, would that help you find the time period if you knew when he worked at that Safeway? I feel like I could be much more helpful if I could be provided with that date through employment records or the IRS or something, Any, anything so that Thank would you. help. I would assume that's true. Dr. Ford, under federal law, and I don't expect you to know this, but statements made to medical professionals are considered to be more reliable. There's a federal rule of evidence about this. Uh, you told your counselor about this back in 2012, is that right? My therapist, mm -hmm. my individual therapist, correct. Right. And I understand that your husband was also present when you spoke about this incident in front of a counselor, and he recalls you using Judge Kavanaugh's name. Is that right? Yes. I just have to slow down a minute because I might have been confusing. So there were two separate incidents yes. where it's reflected in my medical record. I talked about it more than those two times, um, but therapists don't typically write down content as much as they write down process. They usually are tracking your symptoms and not your mm -hmm. story and the facts. I just happen right. to have it in my record twice. So the first time is in 2012 with my husband in couples therapy with the quibbling over the remodel. And then in 2013 with my individual okay. therapist. So if, if uh, someone had actually done an investigation, your husband would have been able to say that you named his name at that time. Correct. Okay. Um, I know you've been concerned with your privacy throughout the process, um, and you first requested that your account be kept confidential. Can you briefly tell us why? Uh, yes. So as I stated before, once uh, it, I was unsuccessful in getting my information to you, before the candidate was chosen. My original intent was to get the information when there was still a list of other candidates available. Uh, and once that was not successful, and I saw that 
persons were very supportive of the nominee. I tracked it okay. all summer and realized that when I was calculating that risk-benefit ratio that it looked like I was going to just, you know, suffer only for no reason. Okay. You know, from my experience um, with memory, I remember distinctly things that happened to me in high school or happened to me in college, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't exactly remember the date. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't exactly remember the time. I sometimes may not even remember the exact place mm -hmm. uh, where it occurred, but I remember the interaction. And many people are focused today on what you're not able to remember <coughs> about that night. I actually think you remember a lot. I'm going to phrase it a little differently. Can you tell us what you don't forget about that night? The stairwell, the living room, the bedroom, the bed on the right side of the room. As you walk into the room, there was a bed to the right, um, the bathroom in close proximity, the laughter, the uproarious laughter, and the multiple attempts to escape and the final ability to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. Ford. Uh, uh, Dr. Ford, I, I want to correct the record, but it's not something that I'm saying that you stated wrongly because you may not know the fact that when, when you said that uh, you didn't think it was possible for us to go to California as a committee or our investigators to go to California to talk to you, uh, we did, in fact, uh, offer that to you, and we had the capability of doing it, and we would have done it anywhere or any time. So, Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, could I put the polygraph uh, results on the uh, record, please? The polygraph results in the record. Without it. But, is there any objection? Well, well are, let us see the chart. The polygraph? You want to all see it? You hold just a minute, please. I, I think you may have it. Yeah, can we have the underlying charts, too? The underlying charts? I have the polygraph results that I would just like to put in the record. I'll, I'll deal with the charts after that. Could I put the polygraph tests in the record? Mr. Chairman, we were, um, we had proposed uh, having the polygraph examiner testify, as you know. If that had happened, the full panoply of materials that he had supporting his examination would have been provided. You rejected that request, so what we did provide uh, was the polygraph report, which is what the members of the committee currently have. And on September 26, Mr. Chairman, this was actually sent to your chief counsel, and I just want to share it with America so that they have this report as well. Okay. We will accept without objection what you have asked us to include, but we're also requesting and expect uh, the other materials that I've just stated. But, Mr. Chairman, you wouldn't allow the underlying witness who performed the polygraph test to testify, nor would you allow Mark Judge to testify. Mm -hmm. And so I would just like to point out, thank you for allowing this report in the record, but that is the reason uh, that we don't have the underlying information for you. You got what you wanted, and I think you'd be satisfied. M Mr. Chairman. I am satisfied with uh, that. Thank Senator, uh, go ahead. When was the polygraph administered? It was administered on August 7th, when 2018, was it? When was and it, it was, the date of the report is August 10th, 2018, Mr. When was it provided to the hey, committee? Let, let's just see if we can't do this in a more orderly way. Uh, well, it was, I was, he was asking, and I have it right here, and you have it as well. It was I, we've September 26th. We've accepted it. All right. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Mitchell for Senator Cruz. Thank you. Dr. Ford, um, we've talked about the day and the night that you've described in the summer of 1982, and thank you for being willing to do that. Um, I know it's difficult. I'd like to shift gears and discuss the last several months. Okay. In your um, statement, you said that on July 6th, you had a, quote, sense of urgency to relay the information to the Senate and the President. Did you contact either the Senate or the President on or before <laughs> July 6th? No, I did not. I did not know how to do that. Okay. Uh, 
prior to July 6th, had you spoken to any member of Congress, and when I say Congress, I mean the Senate or the House of Representatives, or any congressional staff members about your allegations? No. Why did you contact the Washington Post then on July 6th? So I was panicking because I knew the timeline was short for the decision. Uh, and people were giving me advice on the beach, people who don't know about <laughs> the processes, but they were giving me advice. And many people told me, you need to hire a lawyer. And I didn't do that. I didn't understand why I would need a lawyer. Um, somebody said, call the New York Times, call the Washington Post, put in an anonymous tip, go to your congressperson. And when I weighed those options, I felt like the best option was to try to do the civic route, which is to uh, go to my congressperson, who happens to be Anna Eshoo. Uh, so I called her office. And I also put in the anonymous tip to the Washington Post. And neither, unfortunately, neither got back to me in, before the selection of the nominee. You testified that uh, Congresswoman Eshoo's office contacted you on July 9th. Is that right? They contacted me the date that the nominee was uh, announced. So that seems like likely. With Had you talked to about your allegations with anyone in her office before the date of July 9th? I told the receptionist on the phone. Okay. On July 10th, you texted the Washington Post again, which was really the third time, is that right? Second yeah. date, third time. Let's see. One moment. Correct. And you texted, been advised to contact senators or New York Times, haven't heard back from Washington Post. Who yeah. advised you to contact senators or the New York Times? Beach friends, okay. coming up with ideas of how I could try to get to people because people weren't responding to me very quickly. So very quickly they responded to that text for what unknown reason that once I sent that encrypted text, they responded very quickly. Did you contact the New York Times? No. Okay, why not? Uh, I wasn't interested in pursuing the media route particularly. Uh, so I felt like one was enough, the Washington Post. And I was nervous about doing that. My preference was to talk with my congressperson. Okay. Uh, the Washington Post te texted back that someone would get in touch, get you in touch with a reporter. Did you subsequently ta talk to a reporter with the Washington Post? Yes, okay. under the e encrypted app mm -hmm. and off the record. Okay. Who was that reporter? Emma Brown. Okay. The person who ultimately wrote the story on September 16th? Correct. Okay. Did you talk to any member of Congress, and again, remember, Congress includes the Senate or the House of Representatives, or any congressional staff members about your allegations between July 10th and, the July, th and July 30th, which was the date of your letter to Senator Feinstein? Yes, I met with Congresswoman Eshoo's staff, and I think that's July 18th, um, the Wednesday, and then on the Friday I met with the Congresswoman herself. Okay. Um, when you met with her, did you meet with her alone, or did someone come with you? I was alone. She had a staff person. Okay. What did you talk about with Congresswoman Eshoo uh, and her staff on July 18th and the 20th? I described the night of the incident, and we spent time speaking about that. And I asked her how to, what my options were in terms of going forward, and how to get that information relayed forward. And also talked to her about fears of whether this was confidential information. Um, and she discussed the constituent confidentiality principle. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. I'd like to ask a unanimous consent to submit for the record five articles, including one titled Why Sexual Assault Memories Stick and one entitled Why Didn't Kavanaugh Accuser Come Forward Earlier? 
police often ignore sexual assault allegations. Without objection, so ordered. Dr. Ford, I want to begin by thanking you for coming to testify in front of us today. You came forward with very serious and relevant information about a nominee for a lifetime position on our Supreme Court. You didn't have to, and I know you've done it at great personal cost. This is a public service, and I want you to know that I'm grateful to have the opportunity to hear from you directly today. Uh, I'd like to just first follow up on um, that line of questioning Ms. Mitchell was following. Because I think a lot of people don't realize that you chose to come forward with your concerns about Judge Kavanaugh before he was nominated to the Supreme Court. Do I understand correctly that when you, when you first reached out to Congresswoman Eshoo and to the Washington Post tip line, that was when he was on the short list but before he was nominated to the Supreme Court? Is that correct? Correct. And if I understood your testimony earlier, it's that you were motivated by a sense of civic duty and, and frankly a hope that some other highly qualified nominee might be picked not out of a motivation um, at a late stage to have an impact on the final decision? Correct. I felt it was very important to get the information to you, but I didn't know how to do it while there was still a short list of candidates. Thank you, Doctor. According to Justice Department data, about two-thirds of sexual assault survivors don't report their assaults. Based on your experience, um, I'd be interested in hearing from you about this because you bore this alone. You bore this alone for a very long time. And it'd be helpful for us to better understand the ways that that's impacted your whole life. Well, it's, it's impacted me at different stages of the development of my life. So the immediate impact was uh, probably the worst. So the first four years, I think I described earlier a fairly disastrous first two years of undergraduate studies at University of North Carolina, uh, where I was finally able to pull myself together. And um, then once coping with, with the immediate impacts, the short-term impacts, I experienced like longer-term impacts of anxiety and relationship challenges. Thank you for sharing that. And, and yet you went on to get a PhD from USC, is that correct? Correct. Um, as you predicted, um, there was a wide range of responses uh, to your coming forward. Um, some um, thousands of survivors have been motivated and inspired by your courage. Others um, have been critical. And as I've reviewed the wide range of reactions, I've been really troubled by the excuse offered by too many um, that this was a high school incident and boys will be boys. To me, that's um, just far too low a standard for the conduct of boys and men in our country. If you would, I'd appreciate your reaction to the excuse that boys will be boys. I can only speak for how it has impacted me greatly for the last 36 years, even though I was 15 years old at the time. And I think, uh, you know, the younger you are when these things happen, it could possibly have worse impact than when you're a full uh, when your brain is fully developed and you have better coping skills that you've developed um, you know experts have written about how it's common um, for sexual assault survivors to remember some facts about the experience very sharply and very clearly uh, but not others and that has to do with the survival mode um, that we go into in experiencing trauma um, is that your experience and is that something you can help the layperson understand Yes, I was definitely experiencing the fight or flight mode. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yeah, yeah. so I was definitely experiencing the surge of adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine and credit that a little bit for my ability to get out of the situation, um, but also some other lucky events that occurred that well, allowed me to get out of the event. Dr. Ford, we are grateful um, that you um, came through it and that you shared your account with us and the American people and um, I think you've provided um, important information and I'd like to thank you for um, your meeting your civic duty. Um, I wish we could have provided for you a more thorough hearing today. I think asking for the FBI to investigate this matter thoroughly was not asking too much. I think asking to have the other individual involved uh, in uh, your assault, uh, Mark Judge, appear before us today was not asking uh, too much. Uh, I'm grateful you came forward, um, and I'm thankful for your courage, which set an important example. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Ms. Mitchell for Senator Sass. Dr. Ford, um, 
we were talking about you meeting in July with Congresswoman Eshoo. Yes. Uh, did you talk about your allegations with any Republican member of Congress or congressional staff? I did not. Where I live, the uh, Congresswoman is a Democrat. Okay. Um, was it communicated to you by your counsel or someone else that the committee had asked to interview you and th that they offered to come out to California to do so? We're going to object, Mr. Chairman, to any uh, call for privileged conversations between counsel and Dr. Ford. It's a privileged would, conversation. Would, could, could, we, could you validate the fact that the offer was made without her saying a word? Is it possible for that question to be answered without violating any uh, consul relationships? Can I say something to you? Do you mind if I say something to you directly? Yeah. Um, I just appreciate that you did offer that. I wasn't clear on what the offer was. If you were going to come out to see me, I would have happily hosted you and had you had been happy to speak with you out there. I just did not. It wasn't clear to me that that was the case. Okay. Do, does that take care of your question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, pr proceed then. Before July 30th, the date on your letter to Senator Feinstein, uh, had you retained counsel uh, re with regard to these allegations? No, I didn't think, I didn't understand why I would need lawyers, actually. That's what I just didn't know. <laughs> A lot of people have that feeling. <laughs> um, Let's talk about the letter uh, that you wrote on July 30th. Um, you asked Senator Feinstein to maintain confidentiality, uh, quote, until... Wait, wait we... until she retrieves it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to look for it. Which one? Minutes, I think it's... Yeah, it's okay. okay. So stop the clock, will you? It's in there someplace. No. Here we oh, go. I found it. it sorry. Go. Okay. Um, you ask Senator Feinstein to maintain confidentiality until we have had further opportunity to speak and then said you were available to speak further vacationing in the mid-Atlantic until August 7th. Is that correct? Oh, the last line is that what you're, uh, I'm, I'm now just catching up with you. Sorry, I'm a little slower. My mind is getting a little tired. So I am available to speak further should you wish to discuss. I'm, yes, I was in uh, Delaware until August 7th. Okay. And uh, after that, I went to New Hampshire and then back to California. Did you talk with anybody about this letter before you sent it? I talked with um, Anna Eshoo's office. Okay. Um, and why did you talk to Congresswoman Eshoo's office about that letter? Because they were willing to hand deliver it to Senator Feinstein. Okay. Did anyone help you write the letter? No. Okay. After you sent your letter, did you or anyone on your behalf speak to Senator Feinstein personally or with any Senate staffer? Yes. Okay. I had a phone call with Senator Feinstein. Okay. And when was that? That was while I was still in Delaware, so before August 7th. Okay. And how many times did you speak with Senator Feinstein? Once. Okay. What did you talk about? Uh, she asked me some questions about the incident, okay. and I answered those questions. Okay. Was that the extent of the gist of the conversation? Yes, it was a fairly brief phone, phone call. Okay. Um, did you ever give Senator Feinstein or anyone else the permission to release that letter? Not that I know of, no. Okay. Between the letter date, July 30th and August the 7th, did you speak with any other person about your allegations? Could you say the dates again? Between the letter date of July 30th and August 7th, so while you were still in Delaware, did you speak with any other person about your allegations? I'm just trying to remember what dates that... Um... Stop the... You're asking her with the exclusion no, the, of any lawyers that she clock. might have spoken with, correct? Correct. Oh, correct. I think correct then. I, I was interviewing lawyers, Start but I was clock. not... Um, 
okay. speaking personally about it. Aside from lawyers that you were seeking to possibly hire to represent mm -hmm. you, did you speak to anybody else about it during that period of time? No. Okay. I was staying with my parents at the time. Did you talk to them about it? Definitely not. Okay. So would it be fair to say that you retained counsel during that time period of July 30th to August 7th? I can't remember the exact date, but it was the uh, I was interviewing lawyers during that period of time sitting in the car in the driveway and in the Walgreens parking lot in Rehoboth, Delaware <laughs> and trying to figure out how the whole system works of interviewing lawyers and how to pick one, et cetera. So. You testified earlier that you had, um, you didn't see the need for lawyers and now you're trying to hire them. What made you change your mind? Mm -hmm. It seemed like most of the individuals that uh, I had told, which didn't, the, the total number, the total was not very high, but those persons advised me to, at this point, get a lawyer for advice about whether to push forward or to stay back. Did that include Congresswoman Eshoo and Senator Feinstein? No. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Ford for what you said about uh, acknowledging that we had said we'd come to California. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join in thanking you for being here today and uh, just tell you I have found your testimony powerful and credible, and I believe you. You're a teacher, correct? Correct. Well, you have given America an amazing teaching moment and you may have other moments in the classroom but you have inspired and you have enlightened America you have inspired and given courage to women to come forward as they have done to every one of our offices and many other public places you have inspired and you have enlightened men in America to listen respectfully to women survivors and men who have survived sexual attack. And that is a profound public service regardless of what happens with this nomination. And so the teachers of America, the people of America should be really proud of what you have done let me tell you why I believe you. Not only because of the prior consistent statements and the polygraph tests and your request for an FBI investigation and your urging that this committee hear from other witnesses who could corroborate or dispute your story, but also you have been very honest about what you cannot remember. And someone composing a story can make it all come together in a seamless way but someone who is honest I speak from my experience as a prosecutor as well is also candid about what she or he cannot remember the senators on the other side of the aisle have been silent. This procedure is unprecedented in a confirmation hearing. But I want to quote one of my colleagues, Senator Lindsey Graham, in a book that he wrote in 2015 when he was describing his own service and very distinguished naval service as a trial lawyer. I'm not under oath. Uh, he said, quote, of his prosecutions of rape cases. I learned how much unexpected courage from a deep and hidden place it takes for a rape victim or sexually abused child to testify against their assailant. I learned how much courage from a deep and hidden place it takes
for a rape victim or sexually abused child to testify against their assailants. If we agree on nothing else today, I hope on a bipartisan basis we can agree on how much courage it has taken for you to come forward. And I think you have earned America's gratitude. Now, there's been some talk about your requesting an FBI investigation, and you mentioned a point just a few minutes ago that you could better estimate the time that you ran into Mark Judge if you knew the time that he was working at that supermarket. That's a fact that could be uncovered by an FBI investigation that would help further elucidate your account. Would you like Mark Judge to be interviewed in connection with the background investigation and the serious, credible allegations that you've made? That would be my preference. I'm not sure it's really up to me, but I certainly would feel like I could be more helpful to everyone if I knew the date that he worked at the Safeway so that I could give a, bet, a more specific date of the assault. Well, it's not up to you. It's up to the President of the United States. And his failure to ask for an FBI investigation, in my view, is tantamount to a cover-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Flake, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Flake. Thank you. Um, in, we've heard this morning uh, several times that you did take a polygraph, and that was on August the 7th. Is that right? I believe so. It was the day I was flying from BWI to Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. Um, why did you decide to take a polygraph? Um, I didn't see any reason not to do it. Were you advised to do that? Again, you're... you're seeming to call for communications between counsel and client. I don't think you mean to do that. If you do, she shouldn't have to answer that. Could, would, counsel, uh, could you let her answer the extent to which she do, do, doesn't violate the, the relationship between you and Dr. Ford? Say what you understand. Based on the advice of the council, I was happy to undergo the polygraph test, although I found it extremely stressful, much longer than I anticipated. I told my whole life story, I felt like, but I endured it. It was fine. I, I understand they can be that way. Um, have you ever taken any other polygraphs in your life? Never. Okay. Um, you went to see a gentleman by the name of Jeremiah Hannafin uh, to serve as the polygrapher. Did anyone advise you on that choice? Yes, I believe his name was Jerry. Uh, Jerry Hannafin? Yeah. Okay. Did anyone advise you on that choice? I don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't choose him myself. He was the uh, person that came to do the polygraph test. Okay. Um, he actually conducted the polygraph not in his office in Virginia, but actually at the hotel next to Baltimore Washington Airport. Is that right? Correct. Why was that location chosen for the polygraph? I had left my grandmother's funeral at uh, Fort Lincoln Cemetery that day and was uh, on tight schedule to get a plane to Manchester, New Hampshire, so he was willing to come to me, which was appreciated. So he administered a polygraph on the day that you attended your grandmother's funeral? Yeah, correct. Okay. Or it might have been the next day. I spent the night in the hotel, so I don't um, remember the exact day. Have you ever had discussions with anyone uh, besides your attorneys on how to take a polygraph? 
Never. And I don't just mean countermeasures, but I mean just any sort of tips or anything like that. No, I was scared of the test itself, but was comfortable that I could tell the information and the test would reveal whatever it was going to reveal. I didn't expect it to be as long as it was going to be, so it was a little bit stressful. Had you, have you ever given tips or advice to somebody who was looking to take a polygraph test? Never. Okay. Did you pay for the polygraph yourself? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Do you know who did pay for the polygraph? Not yet, no. Did you have the handwritten statement um, that you wrote out? Did anyone assist you in writing that statement? No, but you can tell how anxious I was by the terrible handwriting. Um, did you, we, we touched on it earlier, did you know that the committee has requested the, not only the charts from the polygraph test, but also any audio or video recording of the polygraph test? No. Okay. Were you audio and video recorded when you were taking that test? Okay, so I remember being hooked up to a machine, like be, being placed onto my body and uh, being asked a lot of questions and crying a lot. That's my primary memory of that test. I don't know. I know he took a uh, laborious detail into explaining what he was going to be doing, but I was just focused on kind of what I was going to say and my fear about that. I wasn't listening to every detail about the, what, whether it was audio or video recorded. Well, you were in a hotel room, right? Correct. Um, regular hotel room with a bed and bathroom? No, no, no. It was a conference room. Oh. So I was sitting at a chair and he was behind me. Did you note any cameras in the room? Uh, well, he had a computer set up, so I guess I assumed that he was somehow taping and recording me. Okay, so you assumed you were being video and audio recorded? Correct. But you don't know for sure? I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, recess now for half hour for lunch. Oh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford. We're going to keep going. He said he had a photo. Yeah. You're watching CBS News coverage of the Kavanaugh hearings live from Capitol Hill. They're just now taking a break at the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings. Uh, Chairman Chuck Grassley has just announced a recess. Christine Blasey Ford has been testifying for about two hours about her allegation that Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her in high school. We have heard a series of questions from more than half of the Democratic senators. Special counsel Rachel Mitchell is questioning the witness in place of committee Republicans. Blasey Ford has testified she is 100 percent sure, and she said that a couple of times, that Brett Kavanaugh attacked her. CBS Evening News anchor Jeff Glor joins us at the table. Jeff, what stands out to you first? I think it's, it's just been this continuous swing, Gail, right between the, these big emotional sweeping statements yes. f when we hear from the Democratic senators and then Rachel Mitchell questioning on behalf of the Republicans in this uh, very um, micro-level, step-by-step, uh, almost a sterile sort of question. Mm -hmm. um, and that continues to be, I think, one of the one of the big themes here, right? The other one I think that is developing as you're hearing, we're going to see Brett Kavanaugh later this afternoon. The other name you're hearing a lot is Mark Judge, um, and that is, I think, some are asking where is where is Mark Judge yeah. at this point? Rachel Mitchell appears to be trying to go somewhere, but I'm not quite sure where she's going. Can you, Jan? Because when you look at her demeanor, Dr. Ford's demeanor. Her tone, her demeanor seems to be, how can I help? What do you need from me? There's nothing evasive about her testimony. They brought a couple of times that she wanted an FBI investigation. Last time I checked, anybody who has something to hide is not asking for an FBI investigation. Well, and it kind of goes to the nature of the way they've kind of outlined this whole process, yeah. to have her do it in these five-minute increments. Right. So uh, you feel that she's almost doing a witness interview as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, cross-examining someone in a courtroom uh, and, and asking for facts and, and trying to, like, 
essentially flesh out the facts of what happened that day. Uh, so then when she kind of gets along a, a train of questioning, uh, the five minutes are up and then it goes elsewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to see, though, where she may be yes. going with this. And is there, maybe there's not some aha moment. Maybe this is just kind of fleshing out some of the record to suggest, I, I do think that they are kind of laying